Well, um, I'm kind of fighting a little bit of a bug, so I'm keeping myself over there. and don't want anybody to catch what I have. I'm feeling okay at the moment, so that's good. Um, and maybe, maybe this psalm is perfect for, for me this morning, too. But uh, I want to talk about uh, some firsts. Um, and firsts are interesting because, you know, you get a little bit of fame when you have a first. For example, the first person to walk on the moon was Neil Armstrong. Everybody knows his name, right? Because he's the first person to walk on the moon. This is a little tougher. Anybody know who the first person was to climb to the summit of Mount Everest? Yeah, Sir Edmund Hillary. Yes, Hillary somebody. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there's some interesting firsts. Um, I want you to see this first slide. Uh, this is the first selfie that was ever taken in the United States in 1839 by Robert Cornelius. It also happens to be one of the first photographs ever taken in the United States. The, f the world's first telephone call was by Alexander Graham Bell on March 10, 1876. And his words were, Mr. Watson, come here. And I think that is a missed opportunity. I would have said, Mr. Watson, I want a 16-inch pepperoni extra cheese. That's what I would have said. Uh, the world's first automobile was not by Henry Ford. It was by Carl Benz in 1885, as in Mercedes Benz. So yes, we can, uh, we can hand that accolade to the Europeans. Uh, this next slide, anybody want to guess what that is? That is the world's first microwave oven that was invented by Percy Spencer in 1947. He actually discovered this by accident. He was working on um, a radar when he noticed the chocolate bar in his pocket was melting. I, I can't think that was healthy, you know, at all. And then lastly here, this is the first real commercial video game that came out in 1972. Anybody know what it was? Pong. Pong. That's right, Pong. I actually had Pong. So I kind of, I guess I'm dating myself here. Uh, 1972. Although, interestingly enough, the first patent goes back to 1947. And it was called the cathode ray tube amusement device. So, you know, it sounds kind of uh, sci-fi, doesn't it? Psalm, the reason why I'm talking about first is because Psalm 3 uh, earns the fame of being the first in quite a few categories, actually. It is the first psalm that is actually called a psalm. It is the first psalm that identifies its author. It's the first psalm that states the occasion. It's the first psalm with that word selah that everybody's trying to figure out what it means. And it is the first psalm of lament. It is a lament. And what, what is a lament? Well, one scholar said, it's when the psalmist sings the blues. And that's, that's a pretty good description. That, that's a lament. It's, it's when you're facing a difficult situation. You're complaining, you're crying out, you're feeling um, uh, hurt or discouraged or whatever, and you go to God in prayer. You're lamenting. Um, and believe it or not, it's the most common type of psalm in the book of Psalms. And when I say type of psalm, what do I mean? Well, psalms are classified according to certain characteristics and structures. So we have, as you can see, Thanksgiving psalms. We have psalms or hymns of praise. We have psalms of remembrance, wisdom psalms, royal psalms, psalms of confidence, and psalms of lament. We have, and, and there are other categories, and it all depends on the scholar that you're talking to. Uh, because they classify them different ways. But in general, these are how we classify psalms, and psalms of lament are the most common. Uh, back in the day when I was teaching a class on psalms at the Irish Bible Institute um, years and years ago, um, I decided to give my students uh, an assignment, which actually worked out great. It was a, it was, I, I did it year after year after year after that because it was just, it was such a cool assignment. I had the students write their own psalm. And they had to follow the convention. So if it was a, a psalm of thanksgiving, they had to follow exactly the characteristics of a psalm of thanksgiving as we find them in the Bible. Uh, if it was going to be 
uh, a psalm of uh, a royal psalm or a wisdom psalm. Again, they had to follow the the certain um, characteristics. And so that particular year, I had a lot of students. Actually, I had like well over thirty in my class. And at the end of the year, uh, they put them all together. One of the ladies in the class was an uh, older lady, and she uh, worked at a printing. Um, a company and she decided to gather everybody's psalms and put them together. I actually have it in my office, a little booklet of the Psalms of IBI is what they called it. And sure enough, when the students were given their opportunity to write a psalm, the vast majority of them were psalms of lament. What does that tell you about our spirit? What does that tell you about our experiences in life. So we ask ourselves, what happened in David's life to cause him to write this lament? What caused him to cry out to the Lord? And the background to that is 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 13 through 18. And this is what has happened in David's life that, that inspired him to write this psalm. He had a son named Amnon. And Amnon had a half-sister named Tamar. And this was common to have half-sisters and half-brothers at this time because a man would marry multiple women. He would have multiple wives. And so in the family as it grew, I mean, just think of like Rachel and Leah, for example. You're going to have a lot of kids. They all have the same father, but they have a different mother. So there are a lot of half-sisters and half-brothers in the, in the uh, families in that time in history. And Amnon was the half-brother of Tamar, and he ended up raping her. That's an unfortunate um, scene in the Bible. Absalom, on the other hand, was Tamar's full brother. And he was enraged by this, and he decided to defend his sister's honor, and he struck down and killed Amnon, his half-brother. As a result, Absalom was banned banned from the kingdom, but David, as is typical, kind of changed and softened up and they allowed him to come back. Um, and I think that Absalom resented his father for not handling the situation the way he feels he should have and for, have, for him having to take the matter into his own hand. And so he began to start an insurrection against David, his father, and many, many people in the kingdom turned and followed Absalom, and so David had to flee for his life. That's the summary. Now I want to read it. I'm going to read from Sam, 2 Samuel 15. There's no slide, so just listen. Here we go. Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when any man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, From what city are you? And when he said, Your servant is of such and such a tribe in Israel... Absalom would say to him, See, your claims are good and right, but there is no man designated by the king to hear you. Then Absalom would say, Oh, that I were the judge in the land. Then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me, and I would give him justice. And whenever a man came near to pay homage to Absalom, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. Thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Absalom rose and went to Hebron, but Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, say, Absalom is king at Hebron. And the conspiracy grew strong, and the people with Absalom kept increasing. A messenger came to David, saying, the hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. Then David said to all of his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, or else there will be no escape from us from Absalom. So that's the context of Psalm chapter 3. Uh, and a difficult one for David. And this brings us to our first point, that when in difficult times, bring your complaints to the Lord. Bring your complaints to the Lord. And this is how, this is how uh, David begins. He says, O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. 
And I, as we go through this psalm, really the message is going to be simple, that things are never as bad as they seem when the Lord is on your side. They're never as bad as they seem when the Lord is on your side. Psalm 3 is going to teach us something. It's going to teach us how to pray and what to do in troubled times and where we put our confidence and our trust. It's actually a psalm that mixes two different kinds of psalms. It's, it's not a true lament. It's also got elements of a psalm of confidence in there. So it's interesting. It's an interesting psalm. It's a little bit of lament and a little bit of confidence. But before we unpack all of this, I want us to put ourselves in David's shoes. Can you imagine how David is feeling? His own son is ready to kill him and take the throne. And David knew it. And he knew that he probably should have judged Amnon and didn't. And now he's paying the consequences for it. And Absalom resents his father. Things are bad. But things are bad precisely as God foretold. Do you remember that? Do you remember that moment? So here's what happened. It was after David had sinned with Bathsheba that God promised and had pronounced judgment on David. Look at here in the text in 2 Samuel 12. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. And that is exactly what is happening here. David is getting, uh, is facing death, facing um, discouragement, and in a sense, facing evil, as the Lord puts it, from his own house, from his own son. So we can imagine that David is feeling pretty low, right? He's feeling the pain of God's judgment. He's, his son Amnon is dead, and if that weren't bad enough, his son Absalom wants to kill him. I mean, these are dark days for David. And maybe David felt like God has turned his back on him. So what does David do? He laments. I would too. I assume you would too. But when we're in a situation like this, who do we complain to? And God gives us this psalm in the Bible to say, you complain to me. That's who you complain to. And not only that, how do we play, complain correctly? And so we owe a lot to this psalm and other psalms of lament in the Bible that teach us how we can do this. But first, notice how David feels like the, his entire world is crashing down on him. And Absalom may be the antagonist, but... David feels like it's coming from every direction. Have you ever been there? Have you ever just felt like things are just coming at you from every angle? Anyone ever been there? I have. It's like one thing happens and then another thing happens and you just feel like it's just coming from every direction. David uses this word many, which in Hebrew means multiplied. So his enemies are multiplying. He says, oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. He's not just talking about Absalom. He, he just feels like it's coming from every angle. Uh, I was talking on Friday night with Chris. And Chris said to me, man, it's, it's been quite a year. You know, it has been for the Veenstress. It's been quite a year. Elizabeth, I'm sure, could say the same thing. Don't think in 20 years from now, Elizabeth is going to go, yeah, 20, 2021, 2022, years are good years. No, I don't, I don't think we, any of us would say that. You know, um, I was talking to Chris, and you know, at first he breaks his foot, and then he has to say goodbye to his son for who knows how long. My mother knows what that's like. We don't, years without seeing my mom and dad in, in Europe. 
And then he had a brother-in-law pass away who was young. And now his brother, Brian. I just, it's like one thing after another. And David feels that way. And he's not only facing physical opposition, but he's also facing spiritual opposition. People are assaulting his faith, saying, if God has abandoned David, then we will too. You know, I think we can handle a lot, but none of us want to feel like God has abandoned us. I think that's pretty much as bad as it gets, if you feel like God isn't there. And I know that some of you in this room have felt like that before. My best friend felt like that for a long time. Like, God is silent. He's left me. He's abandoned me. It's a bit like what Job felt like. He would cry out to God and go, "What? where are you? But God didn't abandon David, and he will never abandon you and me. Never. We need to remember that. I have uh, someone close to me who has experienced this in his own life. He had a church, and his church loved him, and he was so successful. He made one mistake, just one, and the church abandoned him. The congregation that loved him abandoned him. Rather than forgive him and show him grace, they discarded him. And you know, that's the way a lot of people in a lot of churches are. I I love grace because I think that we have already shown that as a church, when one of us falls or fails, we rally behind that person, not against that person. But I I hate to say you, that's a rare thing. It seems like most churches are brutal when one of us falls. So being in this kind of situation, the kind of situation that David's in, it can happen to any of us. We can find ourselves in a very difficult place. People that you were close to now seem against you. And if you've ever heard the old saying, sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt you, as a farce. That is so untrue. I'm sorry, kids. We tell our kids that because we want them to be able to bounce back when uh, kids in the playground are not nice to them. But boy, I'll tell you what. Words can hurt. They can hurt deeply. And I think as we get older, I think I'd rather have someone punch me than tell me something that would just wound me for years to come. And in verse 2, David is complaining, complaining about what people are saying. But I repeat, God has not abandoned him. And, and, but there's a warning here. There is a warning. The Lord will forgive our sins just like he forgave David, but that does not mean that he will remove the consequences of our sins. Are you catching that? Because that's really important. He will forgive us, but that doesn't mean he will remove the consequences. There's a great story of a, of a young lad who was just, for whatever reason, really acting up. And his dad, who was a farmer, was just at his wit's end. Now, we've all been there. Maybe some of you were there when you were a teenager. We just went through a period of rebellion all of a sudden. And it it could be for a variety of reasons. Well, this this lad is just rebelling and rebelling, and, and the dad doesn't know what to do. So finally, he came up with this idea that every time that his son disobeyed, he would drive a nail into his barn. So he drove a nail into his barn. And after seeing the nails add up, that young lad finally repented. And he finally asked his dad to forgive him, and they had a good talk. And his dad forgave him, and he went and removed all the nails from the barn. But the holes remained. The holes remained as kind of a forever testimony, so to speak, of that period in his life. And so it is with sin. I mean, the sin is forgiven, but the consequences may remain, and sometimes those consequences are quite visible in our lives. David knows that, and so he complains to God, and he's going to move now from self-pity to examining the character of God. So number two, when in difficult times, put your confidence in the Lord. And so David prays, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. 
I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. These are some great verses, so let's unpack them. First of all, he speaks directly to the Lord. Did you know that? He says, Lord, you are a shield about me. Isn't it a great privilege that we can speak directly to our Lord? We don't have to go through a priest. We don't have to go through a mediator. We can speak directly to God himself. And David says, you're a shield about me. That's evidence of David's walk with God. It's, it's personal. It's confident. And he uses the image of a shield, which I absolutely love, military image. Paul will tell us in the New Testament that the enemy shoots arrows at us. David will tell us that God is our shield. And he is. And we need to remember that because we're all going to experience those times in our lives where we feel the enemy's darts or the enemy's arrows hitting us. But we need to remember that for every one time that God allows us to, to go through that, there may be a thousand times that he protected us with his shield. So that when it does happen, God obviously has a reason. And then the second part of verse, B, uh, verse 3, David uses this word glory the Lord is, you, Lord, are my glory and the lifter of my head. And I love that word glory. It's the Hebrew word kabod. And it literally means heavy. And that's, that's how we, why we translate that into the word glory is because it's actually a military term. The idea was this, that a soldier would go out light, but if they were victorious, they would come back heavy you know, with the spoils of war. And so that word, kabod, eventually, as we can imagine, came to be this idea of glory. And then he says, and you, Yahweh, are the lifter of my head. And that's a, a great Hebraic way of stating uh, that he has confidence in the Lord. David had confidence in the Lord. Do you? Do you have confidence in him? Despite your circumstances. David says, I cried aloud to the Lord. And this, in my opinion, was, this is the verse that I actually thought about most as I was preparing this message. He says, I cried aloud to the Lord. And, and this is why I thought so much about this, because I was thinking about struggles, not only in my life, but the many people that I know, that I have known in my life who have experienced great difficulties, the loss of a child, uh, uh, severe health issues, um, the loss of parents, the loss of a job, the loss of a relationship, tension in the church, all kinds of different things I have witnessed, as I sure you have as well. And here's the thing. When we experience these things, when you experience these things, you have a choice. You can either turn from God or you could turn to God. Does anybody know of someone who was following the Lord, ended up facing terrible situations, and it actually caused them to return from God? Anybody know that? I know. I know people who have done that. You can use the struggles that you face in life to either justify your unbelief, or you can use it to deepen your trust in God. And David leads by example here. He turns to the Lord. And then he says, in the second part of verse 4, he says, and you answered me. God always answers us. And David knows this. He also knows that his dignity is going to be restored at the end of the day. And, and he says that God not only answered him, but he answered him from his holy hill. That's Mount Zion. That's the sanctuary. That's the way, place where God has chosen in the Old Testament to dwell among his people. And David says, you spoke to me and answered me from your sanctuary. And I'll tell you why I love that. I love that image because David knows that although he might be banished from his throne, Absalom might succeed in banishing David from his throne, God hasn't been banished from his throne. God's still on the throne. He's still there. And he's still there right now. And our Lord is sitting 
in his right hand. Our King Jesus sits enthroned for eternity. There will never be a succession. You, you, we all know that one of these days we're going to hear about what the UK, what England's going to have to do is they replace Queen Elizabeth. She can't live forever. She's getting down to the end, I think. God save the queen. Our God, our Lord, will never have to be succeeded by anyone. He's our king, always will be. He's always going to be on the throne, and that should give us confidence. And David goes so far as to say, the result of it, this is that I can sleep. I'm, I'm a little tired this morning because I've been, I, I fought a fever last night that kept me awake. You just ask my wife. I'm not used to that. I, I have the spiritual gift of sleep, okay? I, I know I do. I can sleep anywhere, practically. Where Becky, on the other hand, um, she and, and my son Andrew, who got that gene from Becky, they struggle with sleep. And I, and I know there's got to be statistically some of you in here who struggle with sleep. And sometimes you're in, up in the middle of the night for hours and it can drive you crazy. Can it? I'm up for 15 minutes and I'm going nuts. You know, and Becky's like, don't even, don't even tell me. 15 minutes. Then there are others of you who are like me who, oh yeah, you put your head down and count to 10 and you're out. When you are at that point in your life where you're facing struggle, you're facing maybe a relationship issue, maybe someone at work or someone in your own family like David is feeling, facing, who, who's kind of turned against you and it's just affected you so much that when you go to lie down at night, your mind is turning, your heart is turning, and you're having a hard time sleeping. I, I know that would be difficult. And David says, I have so, so much confidence, even though this situation has not been resolved yet, I have so much confidence in my Lord that I can rest and I can have peace. I can sleep at night, he says. And he actually adds to this idea in Psalm 121. He says this. He says, he will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep or neither slumber nor sleep. Do you know why you and I can sleep and rest when we were facing difficult times? It's because our Lord isn't. And he's watching over us. Kids, you never have to fear when you go to sleep at night because God is always watching. Your Lord Jesus is always watching over you, and he's watching over your parents. Now, David's enemies haven't been conquered yet, but he knows that God will be victorious, and so he can rest, and we call that faith. That's faith. Faith in knowing that God will take care of us. And then in verse 6, six he says, I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. He will not be afraid. So that faith that David has has triumphed over his fears, and that's what we need to do. We need to, we need to have confidence. Confidence in God. Confidence in his plans for our lives, even when things aren't going so well. Before the 20th century, Farmers in Alabama grew cotton. That's what they grew. That was their livelihood. Anybody ever been to Alabama? Yeah? And so that's how that state grew. They were cotton growers. But then, one year, they were hit by what they call the boll weevil. And the boll weevil came in it's an insect, and it utterly destroyed the cotton industry down in Alabama. And farmers were devastated, and many of them had to mortgage their house, mortgage their farms for the next year. And then the next year, the boll weevil did it again, two years in a row. And, de and most, and many, many, many farmers didn't make it. Those that were able to hang on, for whatever reason, pulled together and they came up with a plan and they changed crops. They said, we can, we'll never make it past this third year if we don't 
do something. And we can't afford to risk the boll weevil taking out our cotton a third year in a row. So they did something that was kind of crazy, and they decided to plant a new crop, one that up until that time was mostly just animal feed. They turned to peanuts. They started growing peanuts. And they grew really, really well. In fact, they found that to be so lucrative that they were able to pay off all of their debts just in a few years. And peanuts became the new product down there in Alabama. And they were highly, highly successful. So much so that they did the craziest thing you can imagine. In this one town, all these farmers who are now quite wealthy all got together and they erected a monument right in the middle of town. The boll weevil. They put up a statue of the boll weevil because had that boll weevil never come into their lives, they never would have become as wealthy as they were. You know, we just don't know in our own experiences what God is doing in our lives. Even out of a great trial, there can be a great reward. I think we all would agree going through the trial at the time is not fun. But on the other side of it can be victory. Number three, when in difficult times, cry out to the Lord. Now, this seems kind of redundant, but I wanted to be faithful to the text. That's what he's saying. Cry out to the Lord. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. That sounds kind of rough, but he cries out, save me. This is David's summons for God to go to war for him. He's calling out God to go to war. Because David knows, if anybody does, that it is God who fights our battles. So he gives it to God. Our Lord told us to turn the other cheek. David gets that. He says, if judgment or retribution is necessary, Lord, you do it. I'm giving it to you to fight this battle. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, we read, No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, the cares of the Lord. That's our vindication, that God will come to our defense, that the Lord will come to our defense. And then David concludes this psalm the best way any psalm could be concluded. He says, salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. I sure hope that you know this morning that salvation comes from the Lord. I hope you know that intimately. Do you believe that? Have you confessed it? Kids, there's a lot of you, young kids in here. You know what Romans 10.9 says? It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Amen. You will be saved. And, and, and kids, if you have not done that, if you have not called out for the Lord to save you, then you can come see me anytime, and we'll pray that together. But your parents would love to do that with you too. That's one of the great joys in their life would be to pray that prayer with you. It's the most important prayer of your life. And we also notice in this last verse that there's a cause and effect, right? The cause is God saves. The effect is that God blesses. And frequently, he blesses using uh, you and me. So when God rescues us, heals us, saves us, vindicates us, all of those things, I really don't think it's meant to be an end in and of itself. It's, 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 it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to bless others. When we go through these, these difficult, challenging times that we don't want to be in, if we're honest, and we see God bring us through, it could be a days, weeks, it could be years. What happens when we finally make it on the other side of that trial? cry out and we rejoice and we praise the Lord for seeing us through it. But then that also 
offers an opportunity for us to help others who are going through similar experiences. John Piper would say, don't waste your sorrows. Use them as an opportunity to help others going through the similar things. Let's be honest, we all have moments in our lives when we feel like David. We feel like everything and everyone is against us. We say, you know, it just couldn't get any worse than it is. I, I have had that moment. I felt that way in Spain. Never will forget that. I shared that with you on Friends Day. I remember going out on the beach and just crying out. That, that's kind of how I do things. Let's kind of cry out. And, and I don't know, we could talk forever in a day about whether my, my response was right, but I kind of challenged God. I'm like, hey, do you see me? I'm here. And I'm in pain and I'm struggling. Because I'm really feeling like you went on a trip to another galaxy. And I cried out to him in my own way. My wife is very different. My wife also went through her own period of difficulty, only it was Ireland, not Spain. And she got depressed. In fact, for a couple years, she was, I think we would both agree, in a dark place until finally the Lord both vindicated her and restored her. Sometimes we just slip away into a dark place and sometimes we just throw our fist out at the Lord and say, what are you doing? And you know what? God can handle it. And here's the thing we learn from this psalm is God wants us to go to him when we're feeling that way. It's interesting, isn't it? That lament is the most common psalm in the book of 150 psalms? Clearly, this is a part of our human experience is that we're going to struggle and sometimes we need to cry out. God says, ah, when you cry out, I want you to cry out to me. I can handle it. I know what's going on. Trust me. Have confidence in me. I don't know where you're at this morning if you're feeling like things are coming at you from, from different sides, or maybe things are great with you right now. Maybe you've had that struggle and you're on the other side of it and you're looking back going, yeah, that was tough. Or maybe you just got some bad news. You know, all of us will get some bad news at some point in our life. It reminds me, reminds me of the doctor who picked up the phone and called a patient of his he had seen the day before. He called him up. He answers his phone. He says, hello. He says, yeah, this is the doc. He says, I have some bad news and I have some worse news. Okay, Doc, let me have it. Well, the bad news is that you only have 24 hours to live. What? He says. What could be worse than that? He says, I forgot to tell you yesterday. Okay, all joking aside, life can be a struggle at times. We all know that. And God never promises that our lives will be perfect or picture perfect with no suffering, no heartache, no pain, no loss, no. He doesn't promise that. I'll tell you what, in fact, he never promises to change our circumstances, but he does promise to change us. And we can endure. God loves us. And he wants us to come to him He's told us he will never abandon us. And he wants to help us. So I have a challenge for you, a game plan for you, of what to do when you're facing this in your own life. And it's just coming right out of this psalm. I don't have to improve on Scripture because I can't. Number one, tell God about your problem. Tell Jesus about your problem. If you need to complain, complain to him, first and foremost. I mean, you can come complain to me. I'm just going to direct you right back towards him, right? And I'll, I'll listen, and I'll give you a comf comforting word, and I'll read with you and pray with you. But let me tell you, number one, God wants you to come to him. He wants to be your person. He wants, you, he wants to be your go-to. 
in times like that. Secondly, take comfort in him, have, have constant confidence in him. I mean, I mean, even if he doesn't seem to be handling it the way you think he should. I, I have had those moments in my life where I have said, you know, God, have you considered this other plan? Have you considered this other option? Because I don't really like the one that we're going on right now. And you know what? Here's the thing. When we cry out to God, sometimes he does change things. Other times he does not. John says, and this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You know what? He always hears us. So if he doesn't change our circumstances, he has a good reason. But that doesn't mean he's abandoned us. And then lastly, leave the results to him. Leave the results to him. However, whatever that looks like. You know, one of the great, great 20th century songs of theology goes, don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy. Because I assure you, things are never as bad as they seem when the Lord is on your side. Let's pray.